Hi everybody, I hope you're all well. Welcome to my talk today, a simple overview of clinical incident reporting in healthcare. I'll go through some practical tips when recording an incident, the difference between a near miss and never event, how overall risk ratings are calculated and responding to incidents using risk management systems. This session's aimed at any UK healthcare student, nursing associate or early career nurse. I hope you find it useful. Remember to give me a thumbs up if you do on YouTube and do check out my other YouTube videos on my YouTube channel. So if a clinical incident occurs, it needs to be reported and dealt with according to local and national policy and standards. And reporting and recording events on a clinical incident form, along with the actions taken at the time, we may need to adhere to an escalation policy too, or national health and safety laws, safeguarding policy, it all depends on the incident. So do check out escalation policies. An incident form documents the details of an incident, for example, workplace injury, accidents, a near miss, safety issues or health issues or security breaches. So some example incidents that you might have been involved with or observed as a newly um, as a student or as a new early career nurse or trainee nursing associate. Um, newly acquired pressure ulcers whilst you're washing a patient that will need a clinical incident reporting. You could have received a needle stick injury patient or staff might have been injured by a slip, trip or fall. You could have made an error when administering medication. A confused patient might have gone missing from an area. Um, systems procedure failure. Patient discharge could be cancelled due to lack of adequate support. It could be linked to equipment failures. Um, so an IV insulin being administered too quickly by the um, machine, the equipment aggressive behaviour by patients, and that includes verbal aggression or complaints made by patients or significant others. So don't forget that actions and interventions relating to a patient care incident must be recorded in the care plan and patient notes too. So it's in, you need to record it in the patient's health records for future reference if you've got electronic patient records. The purpose of an incident report is to learn from incidents. So you're complying with national guidance which then enables timely information to be shared locally and nationally on some systems that I'll talk about later. And that helps facilitate learning from incidents. So what is a near miss and never event in healthcare? So it's important that near misses are also reported as they could have caused harm. So a near miss is an act or omission that could have caused harm, loss or damage, but due to chance prevention or mitigation, it didn't cause harm. So there are events that didn't cause harm, but they have the potential to cause injury or ill health. So an example would be some electrical wire out on the floor, a nurse trips, nearly hits the ground. There was potential for them to hurt themselves, but no harm was caused. A near miss is a potential incident where there's no damage or personal injury, but with a few changes in that situation, it could have happened. So if the positioning of the wire was slightly different or the nurse was being called by a patient and looked in the other direction, she could have hurt herself. So following a near miss, actions need to be put in place to ensure that it doesn't happen again. And near misses need to be reported on incident forms. In contrast, never events are serious incidents. They are incidents that were entirely preventable and they have the potential to cause serious harm or death. So they should, shouldn't occur as healthcare providers should have followed national guidance and safety recommendations. So never events include incidents such as the wrong surgery site, retaining a foreign object post-procedure, so you might leave a swab in, a surgical wound, and misplaced nasogastric tubes, so a tube may cause an aspiration to a lung, for example. So full details of never events are detailed on the NHS department website. So if you go on NHS England website, you will see a list of never events in England. When we look at clinical incident reporting, there will be an overall risk rating. Clinical incident forms use these risk matrices to calculate an overall risk rating as follows. So you've got consequence rating, 
times likelihood rating will equal the overall risk rating. So an example consequence rating may be insignificant rated as one, minor as two, moderate three, major four or catastrophic five. Likelihood rating may be rare, one, unlikely two, possible three, likely four, or almost certain five. The overall risk rating is then graded to provide an impression of whether there is a low risk or an extreme risk of reoccurrence of harm. And note that this rating is being used purely as an example, so you must check out what's being used with your own employer, and different matrices and different forms will change um, as documentation and records evolve as well. So some key tips when you're looking at completing a clinical incident form. Don't fill the form in on behalf of others if they witnessed the incident. Whoever witnessed or was first on the scene should complete the form. If there's a number of witnesses involved, then one person needs to take the lead to ensure somebody follows through to complete the form. But what you can't have is somebody on shift saying, oh, I'm too busy to fill in the form and walking off. If they observe the incident, good practice is they fill the form in. Ask an experienced professional to check narrative and support you as you complete a clinical incident form, especially for the first time. And that's the same with all record keeping. Even now, if I was filling in an incident form, potentially I might ask somebody for some advice. Do you think this sounds right? And, you know, don't be afraid ever of asking for somebody to check that narrative. Use concise, clear and objective language. You must only write what was witnessed at the time, what was observed, what you heard, so stating facts. Do not use an emotive style of language that uh, tries to apportion blame, for example. Um, so write factually, chronologically of what happened and the actions that were taken following the incident. Ask union legal advice for adv advice team, sorry, for advice if you need to provide an additional statement. So sometimes as part of an investigation, a line manager or whoever the lead investigator is for an incident, they might ask all the staff that were on that day for um, a statement from them. And I would always run that by your union representative if there is um, some performance issues being looked at, for example. And I found um, I'm known with the Royal College of Nursing and I have done probably two statements in my career and both times in these sort of situations and both times they were amazing because I the first time I was quite junior and I wrote quite emotively and they were like you know that needs to come out you need to write factually so they were fantastic to help advise on writing a statement too. So responding to an incident, all clinical incidents should be reviewed, investigated and analysed to learn from incidents. And our professional bodies, such as the Nursing and Midwifery Council, General Medical Council, support openness and honesty when an incident occurs. So staff are asked to come forward to give statements if it's a serious incident, for example. And as I said, you can take legal advice from union representatives before you forward that statement, if you're worried at all. All healthcare professionals have a duty of candour, and this is a professional responsibility to be honest when things go wrong. So it's important that employers have a positive, open and honest incident reporting structure to prevent incidents being hidden. Because when staff hide incidents or are too scared to speak up, they might make an error, they fail to report, it can have serious repercussions, um, but, you know, patient could die potentially. And it also indicates cultural safety failings in an organisation. So employers should be sympathetic to human error, encourage a climate of learning from incidents, as opposed to promoting a blame culture. Once you respond to an incident report and analyse data, there's four ways to deal with future risk. You either take out the risk or you stop the risk control the risk, you may implement a new policy, a standard, a guideline to control the risk, transfer risk, you might trans uh, look at transferring risk across a team or bringing experts or consultants to transfer the risk, or you accept a, a minimal risk if there's a small chance of reoccurrence. It depends very much on the risk um, and whether it's unlikely to happen or not um, and what sort of impact it had. But they're the four sort of ways of responding to an incident and dealing with future risk. 
So incident reporting and recording data on incident forms is all part of our local and national risk management systems. We've got local systems that aim to collect and manage data on adverts, events, complaints, claims and risks. And performance data from NHS providers is available through national systems. And these national systems monitor trends monthly, quarterly, annually. Um, and in the past, you might have reported a series of incidents or adverse side effects linked to a piece of equipment, for example. But without comparing with other areas and linking data together, those trends and findings might not have been picked up as quick. So it's different nowadays. We've got digital algorithms that are going to be analysing data and picking up emerging trends across services, across employers and across nationally. Um, as uh, you know, as the number of confused patients that have gone missing from a hospital ward or you know or mortality rates get picked up it gives an overall picture of the quality of care in that organization for example and the purpose of risk management systems is in to integrate data locally and nationally to identify learning and then to implement improvement so risk registers provide a framework where risks are recorded with objectives and future actions. So if you're um, a student or a nursing associate, trainee nursing associate or early career professional, ask to attend any meetings. If you, it, you know, it, you can ask about the risk register locally. Um, and it's fascinating to go into clinical governance meetings and see how the process works in relation for following an incident being recorded and how that learning takes place. All risks that are a future threat must be allocated a risk owner who is the lead person responsible for ensuring that the risk is adequately controlled and monitored. And you'll see online systems and actions for monitoring on risk registers. So the risk register provides this tool for documenting risks, controls and actions to manage each risk. And employers will hold operational and strategic risk registers that are integral part of the governance system and to inform local planning and future priorities. So I hope you found this talk helpful today. Do give me a thumbs up if you did. Check out my other videos. There's two examples here, quality improvement and quality assurance in healthcare. It's got all key terms, simply explained and very helpful for interviews. Another, inter uh, another video, what is the difference between research, quality improvement, service evaluation and audit? If you're interested in incident reporting, clinical governance as a whole or as a career pathway, um, it's helpful to review local department websites for risk management, clinical governance and audit activity. Join clinical governance groups, quality or clinical incident reporting groups or committees. Different employers have different terms for those groups and network with local and national clin clinical governance and risk management leads. So I hope you found this talk helpful. If you have any comments at all or questions, do put them in the YouTube comments. Or if you prefer to DM me privately, you can DM me on Twitter or my website. And do check out my other videos on my YouTube channel at Carol Ford Johnston.